and we are ready for the final speaker of tonight. Do we have uh, Judith? Can you can you see me here? Yes, I can, and I'm trying to share my screen. I, I think we're there. That's fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much, okay. Judy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for inviting thank me. Thank you, Judy. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you, and we can see your your slides. Great. Okay. Great. So let me thank you. Thank you really for this wonderful meeting, and also for inviting me. Um, it seems very exciting. And I will talk about cellular senescence. I thought I would bring people up to date on sort of where we are with regard to this, um, this cell fate. So these are just disclosures. I'm not going to talk about any company stuff. So you all know nobody dies of good health. We all die of these diseases. And what's so interesting is that they're very different diseases, and yet they all have the same trajectory. They all start coming up at around the midpoint of our lifespan. And so that has led many of us who work on aging to believe that there must be some basic aging processes. And the process that is now receiving a lot of press um, is this process called cellular senescence. It's a cell fate. It has um, three components. It causes cells to stop dividing, essentially irreversibly, although we will have a paper, I hope, submitted soon, showing that there may even be an exception. Um, it has a very complicated secretory phenotype that we published on um, with Birgit Schilling, who is our mass spec guru at the Buck and um, really shows literally hundreds and hundreds of proteins that are secreted by these cells. And the cells become somewhat resistant to apoptosis, although we recently published a paper showing that it's possible that um, you can overcome this resistance to apoptosis. So the important thing about senescence is it has to be thought of as an evolutionary balancing act. That poses a huge um, uh, challenge for the medical community because there has to be a lot of thought and a lot of care given into how we intervene in this process. And we can, we can intervene. So um, how do you define a senescent cell? So this is the first problem. No way. There is no definite um, marker that will allow you to define a senescent cell anywhere, any place. So I've listed here some of the markers that have been identified in culture. Some of them are pretty good. For example, P16, this uh, cell cycle inhibitor that helps impose the, the growth arrest. But for sure, None of them are absolutely specific. And so the challenge then is how do you have some confidence that a cell is senescent, especially if you want to administer a drug like a senolytic. And in order to do that, um, you have to ask when and where do senescent cells occur in vivo. And there are two times and places. One is they definitely increase with age and mind. Uh, my understanding is this has been shown in virtually every vertebrate species that has been examined and may even. to describe how you would identify an old tissue and, and, and identify it as being different from a young tissue. <clears throat> and we know that inflammation can destroy tissues and cause cells to fail to function, including stem cells. It, of course, 
increases the risk of developing cancer, and it also can promote tissue repair. So good news and bad news. Um, this just is an example. For example, this is a um, this was done in collaboration with Pete Nelson at the uh, Fred Hutch, and it was done mostly by Jean Philippe Cote when he was in my lab. <clears throat> what you're looking at is an antibody array. So this is old. This goes back to 2008. Um, an antibody array of fibroblasts and epithelial cells from the same tissue, the same person. So the genotype is the same and the tissue is the same, but the cell types are different. And you can see there are things in common. There are things that are stromal specific and things that are epithelial specific. And we've seen this now in many, actually virtually all of the tissues that we've examined. Um, it's also, this, this secretory phenotype is also dynamic. It changes over time. I'm showing you a time course of human lung fibroblasts that have been irradiated and induced to become senescent. And this is the time course of a pro-fibrotic leukotriene versus an antifibrotic prostaglandin. And you can see the time course is very different. Um, if you now compare wild-type fibroblasts with fibroblasts, lung fibroblasts from patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, what you see is that the, the diseased patients have a much lower increase in the antifibrotic prostaglandin, perfectly good pro-fibrotic leukotriene induction. Um, this is really from the work we've done with, with Birgit. Um, this was done mostly by Nate Assisti, who's now at the NIH. And we published this. This is on the Buck website. It's called the SASP Atlas. And it lists many, many of the proteins, all of the proteins we've discovered so far, that are in different cell types and also in different inducers. So you can look up and see if your favorite protein is there. And then finally, I just want to give a little um, call out to Chris Wiley, who's now at um, uh, uh, Tufts. Um, he, in collaboration with um, Arvin Ramanathan, who has since left the book, looked at lipids. And it turns out that senescent cells are producing a lot of bioactive lipids, including, as I showed you earlier, prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So there's lots and lots of proteins and biomolecules that could cause disease. The question is, do they do anything? And I'm just going to show you two experiments. The first one was done by Simona Paranello, who's now at the University College London. Um, these are fibroblasts, mouse fibroblasts from a mid-pregnant mouse given, given um, uh, um, pro, um, given hormones that will promote uh, milk production. And this is beta casein, what you're looking at. And you can see that in the presence of senescent breast fibroblasts, milk production falls and the cells no longer form these beautiful alveoli. The same thing is true. This first was done by Anna Kutolaga and then followed up by Jean-Philippe. Um, if you inject a pre-malignant breast cell into the mammary gland of a mouse, they do not form tumors, but in the presence of senescent stromal cells, they do. The tumors are larger. They're also more vascularized. So the idea is with age, we accumulate senescent cells, and they themselves are not the problem. It's what they do to the neighboring cells that can cause a tissue to malfunction. And if that tissue has a premalignant cell, it can even ironically drive cancer rather than prevent cancer. So what do we do about this? Well, as you know, there are drugs now being developed that will either stop the cells from secreting or cause the cells uh, to die. And we prefer 
the method of causing cells to die because um, senescent cells are rare. They take time to accumulate. So you don't need to have the drug for long periods of time. And you can also do intermittent dosing, which you can't do uh, for, with um, these so-called xenomorphic drugs. <clears throat> so this is a mouse we made. It's got the P16 promoter. Again, a good but not perfect um, indicator of senescent cells. A similar mouse has been made by our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, also using the P16 promoter, and then hooked up to it are reporters, but importantly, a killer. And in our case, the killer uh, is the herpes simplex virus thymidine kinase, which converts gancyclovir into a toxic DNA chain terminator, which fragments the mitochondrial DNA. So we and the Mayo Group have shared our mice excuse me, with many, many laboratories. Um, I, I've lost track, and um, I'm no longer keeping track. And each laboratory focused on a different age-related disease and showed benefits to eliminating senescent cells. And those benefits can be either prevention <coughs> and in much rarer cases, actual reversal. So let me just quickly talk you through prevention. We're very interested in these chemotherapies, which are genotoxic and do induce senescence. Um, and what happens is patients then experience accelerated aging many years later. So this was done by Marco de Maria, uh, who's now um, at Groningen. And he treated mice, these mice, with these chemotoxic, uh, genotoxic drugs. They're not all genotoxic. Some of them are cytotoxic. Um, but in all cases, they induced a senescence response, and he could eliminate that senescence response by treating the cells with gancyclovir. So here's one example. He injected a premalignant breast epithelial cell line into the mammary gland, the inguinal mammary gland. It causes cancer. Here's the primary tumor. Here are metastases to the lung and the liver, which these cells are known to do. And in the absence of senescent cells, the primary tumor is variable in how it responds, but the metastases are completely eliminated. Um, these drugs also cause a heart failure in collaboration with uh, Simon Mella at the Buck Institute. We were also able to measure the ejection fraction and fractional shortening. They're, they decline in the presence of these drugs. In this case, we're using doxorubicin. And again, if we treat with gancyclovir, immediately after or very soon after the doxorubicin, we prevent that heart uh, loss of heart function. Cells are also proclotting, and this is a collaboration with Su Yu and um, Pankaj Kapahi at the Buck. Um, again, the cells are pro-clotting after the doxorubicin, and in the absence of senescent cells, that clotting is very much alleviated. So the idea is, is that the removal of these senescent cells can um, delay or reduce the severity of an age-related disease. I have to point out that um, this must happen soon after senescence induction, um, because if you wait too long, it's not reversible. Now, one example of reversal was done in collaboration with Jennifer Elisif, who I think you've heard or will hear from soon. She works in a model of uh, osteoarthritis, injury-induced osteoarthritis. And basically, the idea is, is that senescent cells form at the site of the osteoarthritis, which is where you have bone rubbing on bone. The proteoglycan layer is eroded, but in the presence of, of gancyclovir, they start to rebuild that proteoglycan layer, and they even regain the ability to use that limb. So the idea is that what evolution selected for is senescent cells are required for optimal 
tissue repair, but they should be present transiently. And we think it's the immune system that helps clear them, but we're still not sure about those steps. But when they're present persistently, senescent cells, that is during aging, um, that's when the problems begin. So now, of course, none of us are going to go out and have our genome um, all altered as a function of um, getting rid of senescent cells. And so the question is, are there drugs that can do this? And the answer, which you've heard today, is yes. <clears throat> there are two types of drugs. There are the drugs that are called senolytics that kill and selectively is in quotes because there really is nothing that is absolutely selective. We know that. The others are called cinomorphics and they can selectively suppress certain aspects of the secretory phenotype. And again, they work. The problem is when you remove the drug, the cells tend to secrete again. And so we kind of prefer the senolytic approach because you just need intermittent dosing since it takes time for senescent cells to appear again. So we have lots and lots of work to do. Um, the field is at the stage now where there is no drug that works against all senescent cells. We haven't even identified all senescent cells. There's a big NIH effort now to try to do that. Um, so many labs are working on that, and I think we'll be successful eventually in having a module of biomarkers that we can say indicate senescence. But in fact, we really don't, um, we really are not able to identify all senescent cells so far. <clears throat> Maybe we will be in the future, hard to know. Uh, as I told you, some senescent cells are beneficial. We have new data now in the eye that um, suggests that there may be senescent endothelial cells that are important for maintaining ocular health. And so this is another reason why you wouldn't want to kill off all senescent cells and do it without a, a lot of, of, of caution. And of course, the secretory phenotype is remarkably plastic and dynamic. So at one point, they may be, cells may be secreting certain things that you would like to eliminate, but at another point, they may be really, um, uh, just, um, changing and changing in time. And so that's something that we need to understand better. So I will stop here. I will thank all the people in the lab who have recently been in the lab and have since left. Some are still here. And an incredible group of, um, of collaborators without whom none of this work would have been possible. So thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. That was a fantastic uh, talk. Do we have any questions? We have one from Marco uh, Corta here, down in uh, the front. Hi, Judith. Uh, great talk, as usual. Uh, so you mentioned you now that it's important to eliminate senescent cells like sooner and not wait too long, right? that, that later this effect could be more permanent. But also, um, how does a senescent cells change over time. Even in established senescent cells, the SASP or other phenotypes in, let's say, over the years, in the long run, what do we know about how do they change uh, chronically? Ah, so we don't know over the years in humans because I, that hasn't been done. This is part of what this big grant that was funded by NIH is, is aiming to do. We have done it in mice, and I mean, I, all I can tell you is that um, it changes. I mean, things like TNF-alpha, for example, initially might be high, then might be low, and with certain types of lesions, 
might come up again. So this is the dynamic aspect of the sas that we have to understand. And again, we don't know in humans, but we are getting lots of human tissue um, from old and young people, diseased and not, and hopefully the group, the consortium, which is what NIH put together, um, will be able to get a better handle on answering that question. Very nice. Um, I would actually like to ask a question. So if you, if you are able to identify, let's say you're able to identify the single upstream cause of, a, of why a cell is senescent, and you remove that cause, could you imagine that you can then reverse senescence? No. <laughs> that would, that's not impossible, but it's not likely. For example, if you irradiate a mouse and then you take away the radiation, that mouse has a burden of senescent cells and removing the radiation doesn't do any good. Same thing with something like doxorubicin, you know, adding a drug, a you know, toxic drug. So I think it's, it's unlikely, although not impossible, that removing a stimulus might help reverse the phenotype. All right, more questions here? I think everybody is eager to go to the poster session and have a glass of wine. Uh, but Judith, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really great. My pleasure, my pleasure. And I wish it was a little bit later so I could have some wine too. All right, thank you.